And um, I think Brother Henry will just have you come, minister your words to us, so Father and Brother, and we bless you. Time is yours. Thank you, brother. brother. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. I think it's turned on. Is it turned on? Are we on? Okay. I can't hear myself that well. Woo! Praise the Lord. Don't you love worshiping the Lord? Isn't, isn't that one of the most precious things that God would allow us to be a part of? To be able to worship Almighty God. He says to come into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. And to come into His Holy of Holies with worship. Worship. We've come in with thanksgiving and praise and we've come in and worshiped. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. It is truly marvelous. It is truly wonderful. Truly wonderful. What the Lord hath done. It's awesome. It's awesome. How many picked up one of these books from the table there this morning? How many didn't that probably should have? You will really enjoy this. There's no price on it. I just, we purchased a box of them. And I, because I want them in your hands, if you're seeking answers to your daily prayer life and uh, your relationship with the Lord, this dear man at 93 years of age, this was written. How many of you at 93 are overcomers? I want to tell you something, or hope to be. I don't know if we have any 93-year-olds here. But I'll tell you what, this man was faithful unto death. And God used him mightily. And uh, he talks about many different facets in it. But I really encourage you. He says, Miller's encouragement to those with unconverted family and friends. That chapter's awesome. There are many precious, precious expressions from this dear man and his life that was lived. This is a man that heard from God, and when Hudson Taylor in the 1800s had been shut down by the, the Chinese mission people because he let his hair grow long black in braids like the Chinese men did at that time, he put charcoal on his skin and he put a, a material that would cause his eyes to squint to look like a Chinaman. <laughs> He was called into the headquarters there in China and they said, you've got to stop this foolishness. What are you trying to do? You're not a Chinaman. He said, well, I read in the Bible that Paul became all things to all men if by chance he might win some. Well, that doesn't mean if you're a white man, British, you have to become a Chinaman. <laughs> well, Hudson Taylor said, I'm sorry. But I have to obey the Lord in my convictions. You see, that is one of the most important things in your individual personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you cannot obey the Lord in your personal relationship with the Lord, you have no value to the church. Do you realize that? Because you're only in the church a few hours every week. Maybe only a couple hours for some of you. Some churches I go to, one pastor told me, if you can't deliver your sermon in 15 minutes, it doesn't need to be said. Well, obviously, I didn't need to be there, did I? <laughs> one time, another pastor asked me, what are you going to speak on? I said, I don't know. He said, well, do you have a scripture for us to read? I said, no. You don't have a scripture? No. Well, how do you know what you're going to speak on? I told you I don't know what I'm going to speak on. Well, how are you going to speak? <laughs> I said, whatever the Lord gives me. Isn't that a bit risky? <laughs> that certainly is strange. You see, I... 
I went to college and majored one, two semesters in Bible. Finished my Bible seminary work, if you want to call it that. And I learned homiletics. That's just simply, simply sermon outlining. I learned how to form a sermon. And I learned that you must spend at least seven hours every week for every hour that you minister. People, I spend seven hours in one day a lot of times. So I ought to have something to say when I get before the people. Why can't I have an outline? I don't know. Neither could George Mueller. (laughs) But I want to tell you something. When that missionary board in China dismissed Hudson Taylor handed him his ticket and said, you have so many days to change your mind or get on that ship. Here's your ticket. We're not supporting you anymore. His money ran out the day before he was to get on that ship. He had no money. The next day when he was to get on the ship, the post came or the mail came. They say it in British terms. The post came. That's where we get the term post office. And guess what? In the post was a letter from George Mueller, written six months earlier. (laughs) And in it, enough money to go for six more months. And for several years, George Mueller was the sole supporter of Hudson Taylor. Hudson writes that in his own testimony. You see, it took six months to get a letter from England to China back then. Six months. How many of you can hear from God six months in advance? (laughs) You heard me this morning. I had great difficulty understanding why I couldn't seem to find that phone number for Nova Scotia. But that would have been like six months in advance that I was to be in China. (laughs) The Lord knew it. I didn't. You know, there's a lot of times in our life, He doesn't tell us right up front what He's up to. I call that a setup. Are you willing to let God set you up? If you're not willing to let God set you up, your faith will be stunted. Your spiritual growth will be stunted. Up in the Arctic, there are trees that are six, eight hundred years old. I don't know if you know that. And they're not even as tall as I am. But it takes a carbon tip blade to cut those trees. They're so hard. And it takes a powerful microscope to count the growth rings. Now that is growing up under dire circumstances, isn't it? Do you ever feel like you've been in some cold places? <laughs> Try the Arctic. Hallelujah. It's amazing. Life survives in these radical and extreme environments. And this man certainly had many radical and extreme experiences. But I want to tell you something. They are real and they are genuine. This man believed God for millions of pounds sterling. Back when a million pounds probably was worth more like 10 million then in today's monetary value. And he never told anybody his needs. He went to prayer. Cried out to the Lord, and when peace came, he began to rejoice and thank the Lord. And he focused then on praising God for the answer. Hmm. You young people, I encourage you, get one of these. It wouldn't hurt my feelings a bit if there was not one of them left on the table back there tonight. I would feel like my first set of mission is accomplished. Amen? So feel free. You say, well, I don't have any money. If you will take this book and you will read it, take it anyway. I want it to get a hold of you. I want it to affect your Christian experience. Life is becoming more serious by the moment. Faith is being tested now. How do I know this? 
I see people selling out all across America. How do I know that? There are for sale signs between here and the little town of Middlebury. There are for sale signs in, in estates where we never thought there would be a for sale sign. We thought that estate would go from generation to generation. And all of a sudden, those wealthy people that were so well financially established to where they felt they would never have need of anything, all of a sudden, a gentleman by the name of Madoff made off with their money. They should have known by his name. <laughs> Get a hold of that. I love the Bible, and it is my main book. It really is. I, uh, many nights, I get to sleep for an hour, two hours, and then I get to wake up and spend time in the Word. And I had a great struggle in my 29th year, trying to conform to man's ideals of family devotions and personal devotions. And I can remember there in Portland, Oregon, walking back and forth because I couldn't get down and kneel or sit down and read the Word. I was too exhausted. So I would walk reading the Word. Why? So I wouldn't fall asleep. There were times I almost fell asleep walking reading the Word. I would kneel down by the wood stove Crouch down and pray for a few minutes with great intensity. And then with great intensity, I would fall asleep. And one morning I got up from beside that wood stove and I looked up and I said, Father in heaven, I'm going to bed. I'm never setting another alarm clock to have time with you. I want time with you. I need time with you. I desire time with you. I love my time with you. But I'm tired of falling asleep trying to have it. Now, if you really want time with me, I don't care if I'm only asleep for one hour and I put in a long day. If you will wake me up and I can't go back to sleep, I promise you I will get up and I will spend time with you. That was when I was 29 years old. Well, that next year will be 40 years ago. <laughs> Think about it, people. And I've never set an alarm clock to get time with the Lord. And there have been times when I have gone three days and three nights ministering, praying without sleep. Hit the bed, conked out, slept for one hour. And slept so good. And the Lord woke me up. I looked at the clock, looked at the windows, thinking maybe daylight had come and I had slept for 12 hours. It was only one hour. The birds were not singing yet. And I got up and had precious fellowship with the Lord and went in the strength of that for another day. You see, time means nothing with the Lord. I think there might be a, a title out there of one of the CDs. I'm not certain if it's out there. I didn't set them out. Our secretary set them out. And I'm not sure what all subjects she gave me. But one of them says, Time stands still with God. Hmm. Think about that. Time stands still with God. Do you know that there are times in your life I'll ask you this question. Have you ever been going down the highway and all of a sudden a car is coming at you with such speed? You know there's going to be an impact. And you cry out to the Lord and somehow that car missed you. Do you know time stood still right there? God did something to move you out of the way of that car. God knows how to deal with time. But there's something else about time I want to encourage you. Time spent can never be redeemed 
if it is spent in unrighteousness. It can be pardoned in the sense of the sin that was committed, but you will never, never redeem back the time. I cannot tell you how many people in my life have said to me, I so regret the years that I have wasted. If I had known the Lord as a young man or a young lady, like I do now, they've said, I certainly would have chosen a different path. I encourage you young people, think about that. Think about that. Choose the Lord. When the temptations come, school is going now, you're meeting new friends and there are new temptations, there are new challenges, aren't there? What are you going to do with those challenges? Oh, well, everybody does it. Oh, you don't have to. You don't have to. I never went to the school dances in high school. We didn't believe in it. I had to go to school. I loved school. I loved two things about school. I loved mathematics and science and chemistry. I really enjoyed them. They were a challenge to me. That math, boy, when I got a page full of problems... I couldn't wait to fill it up with answers. But there was something else I really enjoyed, and it was sports. And that was another kind of a challenge. And I prayed much about my indulgence in sports. I never felt like I really did that much. But you know, it amazed me. I was looking at my school annual, high school annuals the other day because our daughter's come back from Australia and she said, Dad, I want, some, I want to see what you look like when you had hair. And I said, well, I guess probably the best and quickest way to show you I had hair was to grab my high school annual. <laughs> we got it out and she was there and our youngest son, that was our youngest daughter, our youngest son was there. He'd come in the door. And when they looked at some of my pictures in sports and all and looked at me on the student council, and my son said, Wow, Dad, you had beautiful wavy hair. I says, Yeah, I did, didn't I? I had. <laughs> he says, You look like James Dean. I says, Oh, well, okay. You had to have a lot of good hair and wavy hair to look like James Dean. But you know, I tried my best to live a Christian testimony. Tried my best. And I lived a clean life and I didn't do the things they did. I didn't gather with the ones that got into trouble and the ones that compromised. But you know what? When it came time to vote who were the most likely to succeed the year of our graduation, do you know I was so amazed that they voted me in? My daughter looked at that and said, Dad, you were voted the most likely to succeed of your class. I said, yeah. Isn't that something? Hank, who was very athletic, says, turned the page, says, you were most athletic. Did you live a good Christian testimony, Dad? I said, yes, I did. How did you get those two awards, never going to the dancers, never running with these popular kids that were in trouble all the time? I said, I just simply kept looking straight ahead and trying to be a testimony. I didn't preach at them, but they knew I prayed. Yes, you've heard me tell it right here. They called me a holy roller in my sophomore year. And finally, I decided to look up Holy Roller in the dictionary. Remember? And I found out holy means pure. And roller means motivation. So I would just look at them with a smile and say, you're absolutely right. I am a Holy Roller. I'm purely motivated. And they would say, it doesn't mean that. 
And I'd say, look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> oh, bless the Lord. There's another book that I would like for you to get. I'm sorry I didn't order a box of these. I really am sorry because when I uh, first talked about it in a church, the lady looked it up on Amazon.com and the book was five ninety five hardcover. Well, in 1970, late 74, when it first came out, I paid fourteen ninety five for it. So that's how long it had been since it was popular. So I went across this country this summer reading excerpts from this book called the Arco Volume, or Archco, whichever way you want to pronounce it or the archaeological writings of the Sanhedrin and Talmuds of the Jews. These are from ancient manuscripts that have been found in Constantinople, or today Istanbul, in uh, this big uh, cathedral, as well as in Rome, in the Vatican and Rome, in their archives. But... There are some things in it that I want to uh, I want to just kind of whet your appetite before I get into speaking about what I really wanted to speak about tonight. I want to challenge you to get a hold of this book. It has many different uh, chapters, of course, how these records were discovered, a short sketch of the Talmuds, Constantine's letter in regard to having 50 copies of the Scriptures written and bound, Jonathan's interview with the Bethlehem shepherds, the letter of Melchor, priest of the synagogue of Bethlehem. This was the Jonathan, the priest, uh, the second number two high priest of, the, of Judaism at that day of the Hebrews. It's his interview and research regarding the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Very interesting. Tremendous. Uh, just... Uh, you were singing some things tonight, and Sherry related to some of this. Some people wonder why we, we have a tendency to get a little emotional at times. Well, I tell you what. Uh, and it, it just... Uh, you read things like this, you know. How can you help but have a little emotion? Uh, Jonathan, to the masters of Israel, servants of the true God, in obedience to your order, I met with two men who said they were shepherds and were watching their flocks near Bethlehem. They told me that while attending their sheep, the night being cold and chilly, that tells me Jesus was definitely born in November or December, not July like some theologians are trying to fool around with your mind on. I've been over there in both times of the year, and I want to tell you something. It is not cold in Bethlehem in July. It probably is 105 degrees temperature. All right? So it had to be December. Some of them had made fires to warm themselves. You don't do that in July in Arizona, and it's on the same line around the earth as Bethlehem. You look for an air conditioner or a cold drink. Some of them had laid down and were asleep. That they were awakened by those who were keeping watch with the questions. What does all of this mean? Behold, how light it is. And when they were aroused, it was light as day. But they knew it was not daylight, for it was only the third watch. All at once, the air seemed to be filled with human voices saying, Glory, 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 glory to the Most High God. And happy art thou, O Bethlehem, for God hath fulfilled His promise to the fathers. For in thy chambers is born the King that shall rule in righteousness. Their shoutings would rise up to the heavens and that would sink down in a mellow strains and roll along at the foot of the mountains and die away in the most soft 
and musical manner they had ever heard. Then it would begin again, high up in the heavens, in the very vaults of the sky, and descend in sweet and melodious strains, so that they could not refrain from shouting and weeping at the same time. Is that emotion? <laughs> they could not restrain from shouting and weeping at the same time. The light would seem to burst forth high up in the heavens and then descend in softer rays and light up the hills and the valleys, making everything more visible than the light of the sun. Then it was, so, it was not so brilliant, but clearer like the brightest moon. I asked them how they felt, if they were not afraid. They said at first they were. But after a while it seemed to calm their spirits and so fill their hearts with love and tranquility that they felt more like giving thanks than anything else. Isn't that precious? They said it was around the whole city. Some of the people were almost scared to death. Some said the world was on fire. Some said the gods were coming down to destroy them. Others said a star had fallen. Until Melker, the priest, came out shouting and clapping his hands, seeming to be frantic with joy. The people all came crowding around him, and he told them that it was the sign that God was coming to fulfill his promise made to their fathers, to their father Abraham. He told us that 1,400 years before, God had appeared to Abraham and told him to put all Israel under bonds, sacred bonds of obedience, and if they would be faithful, he would give them a Savior to redeem them from their sin, that he would give them eternal life and that they should hunger no more, that the time of their suffering should cease forever, that the sign of his coming would be that light would shine from on high and the angels would announce his coming. And their voices should be heard in the city and the people should rejoice. And a virgin that was pure should travail in pain and bring forth her firstborn. And he should rule all flesh by sanctifying it and making it obedience. After this, Melker had addressed the people in a loud voice. He and all the Jews went into the synagogue and remained there praising God and giving thanks. Oh my, there's much, much, much more. Much, much more. It's so precious. So precious. I want to read just a few words about Caiaphas, the high priest. Out of here, there's a chapter on him and his investigation of Jesus and why he condemned Jesus to die. I just want to read this part. It says that... Uh, I'm going to edit a lot more. He said, He has introduced common bread and wine, which are not only forbidden, but are well qualified to excite men's passions and make them forget God rather than to remember and trust Him. We call that communion, don't we? Strangest explanation of communion I ever read. Any of you ever get drunk on communion? <laughs> There's a warning in the Scriptures, isn't there, about that? But he said, this feast having been introduced, that we should remember to trust him in the hours of trouble. When asked why he did this, all he would say was, hitherto I work and my father's work. My father works. Well, he says, these charges were all written by a scribe and all. That's just a little piece of his, his report. But now I want to read and go all the way forward and read about... Caiaphas, the high priest, report about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He said, he called for Peter and John to interview them. Because they were spreading the word everywhere that Jesus had come back from the dead. So I'll just begin with the part, thus argues Peter and John. And he said, if Jesus had power over nature and nature's laws and power over death in others, he would have such power over death that he could lay down his life and take it up again, as he said he would do. 
as he proposes to bring hundreds of witnesses to prove all these that he says and much more. Witnesses with more whose veracity cannot be doubted. And as I had heard many of these things before from different men, both friends and foes. Although these things are related by his friends, that is, the friends of Jesus, yet these men talk like men of truth, and their testimony corroborates other evidence that I have from other sources that convinces me that this is something that should not be rashly dealt with. And seeing the humble trust and confidence of these men and women, besides, as John says, thousands of equal, others equally strong in their belief, it throws me into great agitation. I feel some dreadful foreboding, foreboding a weight upon my heart. I cannot feel as a criminal from the fact that I was acting according to my best judgment with the evidence before me. I feel that I was acting in defense of God and my country, which I love better than my life, and if I was mistaken, I was honest in my mistake. And as we teach that honesty of purpose gives character to action, on this basis I shall try to clear myself of any charge. This is his appeal to the Roman Senate and the Sanhedrin, so that I have not rest day nor night. I feel sure that if I should meet Jesus, I would fall dead at his feet. And it seemed to me, if I went out, I would be sure to meet him. In this state of conscious dread, I remained investigating the scriptures to know more about the prophecies concerning this man, but found nothing to satisfy my mind. I locked my door and gave the guards orders to let no one in without first giving me notice. While thus engaged, with no one in the room but my wife and Annas, her father, when I lifted up my eyes, behold, Jesus of Nazareth stood before me. My breath stopped, my blood ran cold. I was in the act of falling when he spoke and said, Be not afraid, it is I. <laughs> Isn't that precious? The man that condemned him to death, don't be afraid, it's me. You condemn me that you might go free. This is the work of my father. Your only wrong is that you have a wicked heart. This you must repent of. This last lamb that you have slain is the one that was appointed before the foundation. This sacrifice is made for all men. Your other lambs were for those who offered them. This is for all. This is the last. Now, what lamb do you think Jesus was talking about? Himself, wasn't he? It is for you, O Caiaphas, if you will accept it. I died that you and all mankind might be saved. At this, he looked at me with such melting tenderness that it seemed to me I was nothing but tears and my strength was all gone. I fell on my face at his feet as one that was dead. When Annas lifted me up, Jesus was gone. The door was still locked. No one could tell me when or where he went. So, noble masters, I do not feel that I can officiate as priest anymore. If this strange personage is from God and should prove to be the Savior we have looked for so long, and I have been the means of crucifying him, I have no further offering to make for sin. But I will wait and see how these things will develop. And if he proves to be the ruler that we are looking for, they will soon develop into something more grand in the future. His glory will increase. His influence will spread wider and wider until the whole earth shall be full 
of His glory. And all the kingdoms of this world shall be His dominion. Such are the teachings of the prophets on this subject. Therefore you will appoint Jonathan or someone to fill the holy place. I had this book, as I said, in late 74 when it first came out. Put it away in my box. Somehow it stayed there till January this year. <laughs> they kept moving my office in the house every time I go out of the country and come back. My office would be somewhere else. So I never did unpack it in the time we moved to Oregon. I'm from Oregon to the Midwest. And my wife had been ill so many years and was too weak to be going up the stairs. So I felt safe in putting my office upstairs. <laughs> you ladies are always rearranging the house. So was my Judith. So I felt totally safe in finally getting these boxes and making my, putting my bookshelf up and setting my office in order so I wouldn't have to go to boxes for certain subjects. And as I was doing that, I come across the box that this book was in. This was about the 5th or 6th of January this year. Setting up my office came to a dead stop. This book was brand new then. Didn't have any scratches on it. I started reading. I decided this is too good. I got to make my own index in the back. So I started making page by page index so I could quickly go back to references of things that just stirred me. And as I sat up there in my seat, my chair in my office, I had many days before I left for Japan just weeping before the Lord as I read this. Now, people and critics will always try to say things like this are false, they're wrong. But you know what? When things that are written in this book coincide with this book, I'm going to take it. I'm going to accept it. Why? Because in this book, the Bible, Jesus said, I suppose that if all the books could be written that should be written, that even the heavens themselves could not contain it, or the earth could not contain all the books that could be written. I encourage you, get a hold of that book. Just simply go up to Amazon.com and look it up or get a copy of this tape tonight. I think you can do that. CD or whatever. And uh, go to a bookstore and ask for the ARCO, A-R-C-H-K-O volume. ISBN number 0-87983-8. Dash zero six seven dash zero. Now it might not be in the bookstore. You might have to get somebody to go on a computer for you and uh, look up under Arco volume. It's in there. As I said before, I started out across America this summer on Amazon.com. The first place I shared this, I was staying at the people's home that night. They looked it up. And it was five ninety five, hardbound. As I said, I paid in seventy four fourteen ninety five. I made a, a terrible mistake right then. I should have ordered a hundred of them, because by the time I got up to Maine, these books were getting up to forty fifty dollars a piece. That means. The publishers might have to reprint it. Wouldn't that be terrible? <laughs> Wouldn't it be awful if it began to circulate again and began to speak into young and old alike? I tell you, the reports here are awesome. So I encourage you, get a hold of one and read it. Read it. Don't listen to the critics. Read it with the Bible. Read it with the account of the four Gospels. Read it with the account of the Apostle Paul and his writings. And I'll tell you what, it'll ring true. It'll ring true. So it's precious. There are many documents here that tell where they, where they found these and uh, the story, the testimony and witnesses. 
of this being done. And this was being done the first year that it was entered into the Library of Congress was 1887. All right? That's how long it's been around. And then this last printing, according to this, was 19... Copyright, they entered as 1975. So, it needs to come back out again. These kind of writings need to get into our hands to challenge us to realize how important it is to not let these things slip away from us. Anything that you read Anything that you receive from ministry that causes you to fall more in love with Jesus, that causes your heart and your spirit to be humbled under the presence of a precious, tender, loving, and forgiving God is something you should get a hold of, isn't it? Because you see, we're getting nearer now than when we first believed. And God is preparing our hearts to stand before Him. Almighty God to stand before Him. And I'm excited. I'm excited. Now, I have to clarify something. My Judith and I had a a discussion this afternoon. And she said, Henry, you should have clarified why I said to you, you will never die, you will live forever. Remember me saying that at the end of my presentation this morning? I said, well, I felt I had kept the people long enough and it was a good note to end it on. She said, it needs clarification. So I have to obey my wife, right? (laughs) So what she meant was, when I was 21, I lost three days with a heart attack. I don't remember those days, all right? When I came out back conscious again, I was so weak I couldn't hardly lift my head. I prayed and cried out to the Lord, and then I was hungry. I crawled into the kitchen. I tried to stand up at the counter to get a box of cereal out, to have a bowl of cereal. I got the bowl out. It was on the floor. I reached up in the drawer and pulled a spoon out. I managed to get a hold of the box of cereal and bring it down to the floor. But when I went in, crawled over to the refrigerator to open the door of the refrigerator to get the milk out, that little half gallon of milk was so heavy to me, it come crashing down on the floor. That's how weak it was. The horn honked outside And it was my ride to work. They wondered where I was. One of those days, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, I don't remember. This was Tuesday. I had missed a day of work. So you see, they came to the door, banging on the door, and I hollered and said, I'm in here. Help me get to the car. I'm going to work. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm a different kind of an animal from both of than from most of you. I believe in healing with all of my heart. I was healed of bronchial asthma at nine years of age, and I've never had it since. And as I said a few minutes ago, I played in track and football and basketball in high school, and I never had any problem with asthma because I was healed. And when God heals, it's gone. It's, it's a done deal. Amen? And so you can't have asthma as bad as I did, pass out, not being able to get your breath and play in the sports. It doesn't work. Especially running the 440 and the 880. <laughs> uh, and then doing the, hur- the high hurdles. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you can't do that with asthma. You, you'll shut down about midpoint if you get over the first one. But anyhow, uh, God healed me of that asthma, and then He healed me. I went to work. I tried to muster up as much strength as I could to get into the plant where I was working. They helped me into it. The foreman took one look at me walking down the hallway, 
he come up to me and he said, Henry Groover, I'm not going to ask where you were last night. You are pale as a ghost and you're not going taking another step in this building. You turn around and you go back to the dormitory. I was at the university there in Texas at that time. You go back with these fellows that have finished their second shift. I was working the third shift at that time. You go right back home. I don't want you dying on my shift. <laughs> I said, but I'm getting stronger. He says, you're not convincing me. Go. <laughs> so I left. I went back to bed when I got home. And I slept, and then I woke up. I was in my own little apartment. I walked over to the dormitory of the school. I was walking down the dormitory, was looking for a brother that I had led to the Lord on the streets, who was a heroin addict, had gotten gloriously delivered from drugs in my home. He was one of those five men that I had in my home rehabilitating when I was still a teenager in Phoenix, Arizona. And then he went off to college with me, to Bible college. He took the Bible part, and I took Bible college, at some of that along with my other education. And I was looking for him because he had gotten heavily into, into reading on faith. And uh, who's the apostle of faith? I'm trying to think of his name. Help me. Wiggle Smith Wigglesworth. Yeah, Smith Wigglesworth. And the Sunday night before this happened, I was sitting as in the audience and he was preaching as a student in this church. And across the front of it, he had the people line up for prayer that needed prayer. The first lady lining up looked like she was 10 months pregnant. But she wasn't pregnant. She had a tumor, a malignant tumor. Now, he had been reading Smith Wigglesworth, and in there he had read how Smith Wigglesworth, one night in a meeting, took off on a dead run and slugged that woman right in the stomach, and she was healed. Now, I was sitting about where the young man is here with the light blue on, and I saw him get over, and here's the line over here, and she's the first person in the line. And he's standing there praying in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, I see him do this. <laughs> and I sit there and I said, Ron, don't do it. He looked at me and grinned and shook his head no. And I thought, well, he's not going to do it. But at that instant, he took off on a dead run. And as he ran toward her, he said, lift your hands and praise the Lord. That's what Smith Wigglesworth said. He was following the instruction book perfectly, and he come back with his fist running and full bore hit her right in the stomach. She screamed the most blood-curdling scream. She didn't fall down. <laughs> but thank God she had a full-length skirt on. The tumor was gone. That woman was instantly healed. I sit there and I thought, Lord, I will never have that much faith. <laughs> the reason he's got it is your word says, he that is forgiven of much loveth much. <laughs> he's got a lot more love than I do and a whole lot more faith. But we teased him about that for a long time. But you know what? It didn't slow him down. And he, he became a very radical man. And uh, for many years, I don't know if he's with the Lord now or not. I never see him anymore. But for many years, his name was all across America. He's up there in years now. But that, that was the faith that he locked in on. Reading day and night, Smith Wigglesworth. <laughs> can be dangerous. It can be. I've thought about these kind of things many times. You'll remember the testimony that I gave 
when I was dying of cancer. And the battle that I fought with that cancer in two years to the very point of my spirit trying to leave my body with death. You ever been in a battle like that? Now that is what we call a real life and death battle. Having died in the automobile accident in 1984, I knew what it felt like to die. This may be one of the reasons that my wife said to me, Henry, you will never die. (laughs) Because she said to me, I didn't say the rest of that this morning, you refuse to lay down and die. (laughs) She said, I lay down and all four feet go in the air. And I say, Lord, I'm sorry. I give up. Take me home. You get up and start going. And you won't lay down. Well, that is literally what happened with that cancer, wasn't it? The enemy kept telling me, tell them to stop the car. That you need to take a walk out in the woods. I had walked and prayed with them. And there were times I needed to take a walk alone in the woods. We were praying some satanic stronghold areas. And there were times I needed to take a walk in the woods alone because I would begin to hemorrhage. And I knew, always knew when I was going to start hemorrhaging. And so I would get away from them and do the hemorrhaging, clean myself up, and go back and join them, continue walking. That was a fight. That's a fight. I had a brother say to me on the phone the other day, he said to me, Henry, I don't understand And I just said it to a brother sitting here tonight, too, yesterday. He said, I don't understand. How can you fight so hard when you are so ill and so weak? When it seems nothing is changing? I say, because of a song that I learned as a teenager that the quartets ran all over America singing. Remember it, some of you? It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight. It's not a game. Run if you want to. Run if you will. But I came here to stay. That song got a hold of me as a teenager. If I fall down, the word said, I'm going to get up because I didn't start out that way. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight. It's not a game. That is why I believe the Apostle Paul calls it the fight of faith. Instant healing is one of the most wonderful healings. But I have witnessed many, many times in my life when people were instantly healed. They didn't pay a price, so to speak, for that healing. I've seen people lose that healing. I've seen people years later. I know one very well in Portland, Oregon. That should be a quadriplegic to this day. But he said, I was never paralyzed from my neck down. He even denies the injury now. And says, oh, you just prayed. It just took a while for my feelings to come back. Ah, sorry. You fall 16 feet on your head on the floor backwards. I'd say it takes a whole lot longer than a few minutes for the feelings to come back, wouldn't you? (laughs) When the paramedics punch your toes full of holes and you don't feel it, I'd say something more serious is wrong. You see, to me, he was healed by the mercy of God because of my prayers and because the Lord heard my cries. But not because he really believed. It was my faith. Do you know you can pray for people and it will be your faith that will heal them? Not their faith. Catherine Kuhlman certainly proved that in many of her crusades. There were thousands of testimonies in her lifetime of people that came to her crusades and said, I didn't even believe in God. I was an atheist. I was an agnostic. I definitely did not believe in healing. 
I believed in the doctor, but I didn't believe in God. And instantly, their affliction was healed. Then they believed. And that's Scripture, isn't it? The prayer of faith. It doesn't say who prays it, does it? But the prayer of faith shall save the sick and raise them up from the bed of affliction. And if they have committed any sins, how much is any? See what I mean? You can't categorize, well, this one can be forgiven, this one can't. If they have committed any sin, it shall be forgiven them. God wrote that in here. I didn't. That's why I believe God. That's why I believe and pray for people. There's a reason why I don't have healing crusades. (laughs) It's very, very rare for me to tell a pastor, tonight I will preach on healing. I'll tell you the truth. I have not done it in one church this year yet. And I've been in hundreds of churches in overseas and here. This is the first church this year that I've told a pastor, tonight I want to I want to minister on healing. Why? I don't want to be known as a famous healer. I'm not a Benny Hinn. I'm not a Catherine Kuhlman. Definitely not Catherine Kuhlman. I don't look like her. <laughs> I'm not Oral Roberts. I'm just Henry Groover. But I have seen God heal sometimes in meetings, hundreds of people in one meeting. I saw it in Siberia. It's on, it, it was broadcast across live across Russia. We emptied the hospital out in that town. And that afternoon I had walked down the aisles of that hospital that were no wider than this aisle, but on each side of the aisles were stretchers loaded with sick people. I prayed for a whole group of them down that aisle and three were healed. Because those three jumped off that stretcher and were healed, that head doctor brought the ambulance to the crusade, that one night crusade up in Siberia, brought people and the whole front, bigger than this, of that big coliseum was packed full of stretchers, wheelchairs, crutches, emptied out the hospital because three were healed. This was right after Glasnos, Perestroika, right after the... The Iron Curtain come down and you could go in. I went into the other place. Many were going to Moscow, St. Petersburg, and that end of Russia. I went into Siberia where they weren't going. I went into the cold country (laughs) Where, where it was very cold. Very, very, very cold. Well, it was so cold we landed on the ocean. And a giant plane was about the size of a 767 Aeroflot. And uh, it didn't break the ice. That's pretty cold, isn't it? (laughs) The ice fog, the haze in the atmosphere was blue. They said it was about 60 below zero, minimum of 60 below zero. I was walking and praying the streets of that city when for $11 I could rent that whole Coliseum and have a one-night crusade. 11 American dollars rent a massive Coliseum. That would pay for everything. Here you've got to pay insurance. You've got to pay everything. You know what I mean? You've got to pay for security people. Eleven American dollars. <laughs> Hallelujah. For two dollars, I got bulletins printed up while I was walking the streets praying them with my, my uh, interpreter from the, uh, another part of Russia who had come to America recently and uh, from the Ukraine. All of a sudden, KGB car comes flying up. We're surrounded with KGB. My poor Ukrainian brother who had just, just gra- come to America, almost crying, afraid to cry because it's so cold, but is saying to me, we're going to go to jail. We're going to go to jail. I said, we're not going to jail unless the Lord wants us to. Now calm down. If he wants us in jail, then we need to be there. He says, you've never been in a Russian jail. I says, well, maybe this is the first time. Maybe I have a divine appointment. Leave it alone. 
They're around us. They're not saying anything. They're not interrogating us. Another car pulls up. A lady in a mink stole comes up. They open up. Here she comes in the middle of it. She has one of our bulletins. And she says, are you the gentleman? In perfect English, are you the gentleman handing these out? I said, yeah, I got a handful, pockets full of them. I think I am. Will you come with me? Do I have to? I said. <laughs> KGB all around you. That's a good question to ask, isn't it? Do I have to? And she said, I'm sorry. I represent the official news agency of the Soviet Union, the TASS news agency. I have wired St. Petersburg, our headquarters, about your crusade tonight. You don't know it, but that Colosseum that you have rented, the marble podium that you will be speaking from is the same podium that Lenin made his famous speech behind this very night so many years ago. I've forgotten how many years it was now. This is a historical night for all of Russia. See, I told you about a divine appointment this morning in China. This was my divine appointment in Russia. But it went totally different from the one in China that I told you about this morning. <laughs> God had another plan. Don't put him in a box. He's the creator. He's the originator. Because it went like this this time, it definitely won't go like it the next time. Turn God loose to be God. He's going to do it original and unique every time. When you get prayed for tonight, believe God for your healing in a whole new way. I don't know how I'm going to pray for you. I don't know how the elders. All we know in the Scriptures, it just says, call for the elders, anoint them with oil, and lay hands on them. I don't know. That's all. And it'll heal them. They'll be healed. Now, this either means what it says or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, I should disappear right now. Because I should not be here. I should have been in the grave a long time ago. So I went to the headquarters, signed a contract. That they would put six television cameras in that big coliseum. They would be broadcasting live all over Russia. And that I would give them the first five minutes, that lady, to announce to all of Russia that the Supreme Soviet had just voted unanimously to allow Christian broadcasting. And this will be the first Christian broadcast in 70 years, the history of Russia. People think about that. You see why I say don't limit the Lord. I was just walking a city where it was very, very, very cold. Walking very tenderly because it was slippery. You see what I mean? And God set me up. And then her next request, I'm just editing a lot, was I am very close friends with the head physician of the hospital and they are overflowing. You are a Christian do you believe God heals people? I said, if I didn't, I wouldn't be here. I'd be dead. And I told her about my accident where I died. And the Lord brought me back. And uh, I hadn't had cancer yet, so I couldn't tell her about that one yet. That would have been prophetic. <laughs> and I wouldn't have liked to prophesy that one. <laughs> she was so touched, she said, would you come with me to the hospital? Maybe we will get to see some people healed. There is so much suffering in this city. I said, absolutely. So we went to the hospital. Like I said, three people were healed down that hallway. And that head doctor got so excited that when we got to the Colosseum that night, the cameras were set up. The lady got up, first five minutes introduced this whole new thing. The, so the Soviet had had voted unanimously in broadcasting and told that this is a historical night in all of Russia, how Lenin had stood where I am standing and made his favorite, famous speech this night so many years ago. And now, to show all of Russia, for this is live all across Russia, eight time zones, live Christian evangelism broadcasting for $11. 
<laughs> you don't think God knows how to do things in a nice economical way? My wife says it's the Scottish blood in me. Nah, it's my God. My Lord had to have some kind of blood like that too, because when it came time to pay the taxes, he just sent Peter to fish. <laughs> He didn't say take it out of the little coin of bags there, bag of coins there, and pay the man. Peter, go fishing. You, tax collector, go with him. Huh? What'd you do? Bury it along the bank? Yeah, no, actually, it's under the water. Oh. What are you doing with that fishing pole? Well, I'm going to do what Jesus said. I'm going to cast a line in. You're going to catch on that kind of hook money? No, I'm going to catch a fish. And the first one I get is going to be a gold coin in his mouth. <laughs> I'm going to pay you the taxes. You see, if IRS comes and audits you, all they really want is your money. Pay them. Give them their money, they'll go away. Unless they don't deserve it. Then show them how they don't deserve it. That's called record keeping, right? <laughs> You, you watch it. If you watch this court program, what wins the, the plea every time? Paperwork. Documentation. Prove to the judge you have the documentation and you win the case. That's all with IRS. Keep records. Don't be sloppy in your business. Because if you do, you're going to pay to the uttermost penny. That's... Well, I'm not an agent of the government. That's just wise bookkeeping. So anyhow, we preached that night. And I tell you, it was powerful. And all of a sudden, a lady about right there where you are, who had come up very slowly, would take a few steps and stop. Take two or three more steps and stop. And finally got over where she could sit down. Jumped up, screaming. Ran through the stretchers and off to the side and up into the balcony. And was jumping up and down in the balcony. And I said to speak, screaming in Russian. And I said to my interpreter, what is she saying? She was interrupting my meeting. My meeting. Oh, yeah? No, the Lord's meeting. The Lord doesn't mind interruptions, does He? The wisdom from above, according to James chapter 3, is easily entreated. It, it doesn't mind interruptions. That was a wonderful interruption. <laughs> My interpreter said her heart was so enlarged, when she came in, if she took the fourth step, she would drop dead. She just ran up into the balcony. She's jumping up and down, saying, I'm healed. My heart is on fire. Jesus healed me. And that was the first kernel of popcorn to pop. You ever watch popcorn popping? After that first one pops, you better put the lid on, hadn't you? Real quick, because they're going to start popping all over. And that's exactly what happened. The cameras were busy because God was emptying the wheelchairs and the stretchers. And as they emptied them and wheeled out the, the stretchers and the wheelchairs, the ambulance would go to the hospital and bring another load back. Till almost two in the morning, we had emptied the hospital. They all walked out healed. Now that's my God. Now... A little later, I asked the Lord in the middle of the night, Lord, why don't I see this all the time? You know what he said to me? He said, because if I did this through you all the time, the people would only know you as a healer. But he said, I don't want them to know you as a healer. I want them to get the message I have given you that I want communion with my people again. I want them to walk with me and talk with me. 
and fellowship with me. I lost it in the garden. And I've had very few since then that have walked with me. Enoch walked with God. And what was his reward? Goodbye. He was not, for God took him. One step he took was his last one. I'd like to go to be with the Lord like that. Now, I don't know if I'd get as much reward doing it that way as if I get to go to some Islamic country somewhere. I'm invited to Istanbul now in March. Turkey. I haven't been there now since about 1993. Uh, I don't know. To teach prayer walking. Spiritual warfare. Doug, you want to go to Istanbul and teach spiritual warfare? (laughs) I don't like Turkey. I like Turkey meat, but I don't like Turkey country. (laughs) I enjoy my water without parasites. (laughs) I'm still working on that one, or the Lord's still working on me whether to say yes or no. Uh. But God did a miraculous thing that night. And I asked him why he didn't use me that way all the time. And he said, but I just told you. If I used you that way all the time, people would just come for healing. But I have much more to give them through you. And he said, it is more important to me that I am able to regain fellowship and communion with my people than if their bodies are healthy. Did you hear what I said? I believe in divine health. But I've been sick. I believe in divine health. But I've almost died sick. But God's healed me. There have been a few times I've had some pretty good headaches and I've taken aspirin and they went away. I can't say the Lord healed me that time. So I'm sorry, I'm not Kenneth Hagin. And I can't say to you, I've never even taken an aspirin in my life. I sinned. I've taken a few aspirin. (laughs) In Kenneth Hagin's book. But healing is the children's bread. And in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said, If you ask the Father for bread, will He give you a stone? If you ask for a fish, would he give you a serpent? No. He'll give you bread. He'll give you a fish. We need to recognize this and believe it with all of our heart. That what Jesus said, he will do. And when you set out to trust the Lord, from the moment you set out to believe God for your healing... Time must stand still. Time is no longer of the essence. Please remember that. It has nothing to do with your healing if it's instant or two years later. Time does not ever negate the power of the truth. There will come a time... (laughs) When time will be no more. Oh, glory to God. But people, you won't need any healings then. You'll be forever in the presence of God. There'll be, as we sing it tonight, there'll be no sickness, there'll be no pain. But between now and then, we must give Him our sickness. You sang it. I gave Him my sickness. I gave him my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Do you? Or, why, Lord, why, Lord, why, why, Lord? I gave it to you, but now you gave it back. That isn't the way it's written. You'll never break into a dance doing that. (laughs) <laughs> Yanaguni Island, the westernmost island of Japan, back in February this year. 
I spent four and a half hours bouncing around in a 22-foot ferry boat over 60-foot seas, the East China Sea. Do you know how you, how you bounce around on 60-foot seas? At times you feel like you're in the air more than you're in the water. And then there are times when you're in the air and the front of the boat's coming down and you're thinking, I'm going to submarine. But this boat isn't a submarine. But sure enough, you hit and up you go again, four and a half hours. Most of the people on that little ferry lost whatever they had eaten. It was not a pleasant experience. The odor was bad enough. I, I wanted to holler, hang your head over, but I was afraid they'd fall out. <laughs> so obviously, when I got to Yanaguni Island, I was exhausted. But you know what? I sang most of the way. When we hit the heights of the waves, I sang about... What's the song? Ah. Uh, the voice of my beloved, here he comes. <laughs> Leaping upon the mountains and skipping o'er the hills. The voice of my, my beloved, lo, he comes. <laughs> I sang that and sang it. I didn't have to worry about them hearing. They were screaming too loud. <laughs> so it gave me full coverage and full opportunity to sing at the top of my voice. I was tired when I got there. I hadn't lost my meal. I was, my interpreter didn't feel like having lunch. I did. He had lost everything and he wasn't ready to get it back yet. <laughs> so we went and got a, a room and we rested a little while. And then we went and had a lunch or a meal about 2.30. And then we got in another boat. I had, while he was resting, I had rented with windows in the bottom. Remember me telling you about the eight underwater cities that are around the islands of, Jap of Okinawa? I thought they were around Okinawa Island. They are around the Okinawa Prefecture, which is about 21 islands. They're in that distance around. Yanaguni Island is, right off of Yanaguni Island, is where the big city is that was built like the Aztecs, has the Aztec pyramids down there, has the altars like the Aztecs that are above the ground, their remains above the ground on the Atlantic region. The number one specialist with Aztecs from Oxford University did a, a video on this and a documentary on it showing how the architecture and all is the same as the Aztecs over in the Atlantic region. Except for one thing. There's a submarine base down there that's like our Bangor. I think Bangor submarine base in, in Washington State. I've been, I, I said before, I think I, I used a different name and I got corrected in Washington just a couple months ago. It's not Hanford, it's Bangor, Henry. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. From Bremerton is Bangor, nuclear submarine base. Yeah, not Hanford. Where did I get Hanford? I've been saying it wrong. If it's on tape, forgive me. But anyhow, but it's 500 feet underwater. That submarine base. Designed like the Bangor submarine base on top of the water where, where our nuclear subs come to be recommissioned and all. Now you figure that one out. Well, if you're going to have any problem figuring it out, just go to Genesis. All right? Chapter 6 and 7. And you'll have no problem. Call the days of Noah. A little bit of a flood. Hmm. 500 feet underwater in the East China Sea. But I wanted... I don't feel like swimming 500 feet under. <laughs> I don't really like... I don't feel secure in the water, so I felt secure on the water even though I'm bouncing around. And so I talked my interpreter into going again back on the sea. <laughs> he said, you're crazy, but I'll go with you just because I don't want you to be away from me. If you're going to sink, I'm going to sink. I said, we're not going to sink. There were times as we came over that city, looking down through the windows in the, in the bottom of that boat, looking through the windows in the bottom of the boat, there were times as we were turning and the waves would hit us that I saw daylight out of the window of the bottom. What does that tell you? 
you're listing what's called listing dangerously. When you can see daylight out of the bottom, you're about to flip upside down. Hmm. There were people screaming on that boat, too. I was too busy bouncing around trying to take pictures. I got some pretty good pictures of it. I'm sorry I didn't put them on the CD. I should have put them on there, the DVD. But I uh, could have shown you those tonight. But why would you want to do that? Are you just an explorer? Do you love just getting out there and, and seeing things and, and being in new areas? No, I had one motive for being there. I can't walk the streets of that underwater city that perished in the days of Noah. But I can pray over it and remit the sins and take dominion over the wickedness, the spirit of wickedness that prevails down in that, that East China Sea area. Because whether you realize it or not, that East China Sea is a melting pot getting ready to boil over. And so... How do you come against these kind of things? Do you come against them by just simply going into China and working with the leaders? Well, that, that's one facet of it. But the other facet is you've got to deal with the ancient sins all the way back to the roots. Remember how I remit? To the very first thought, word, deed, or gesture. As many generations back as needs be. Noah's day. To break the curse off of that of which we, we worked on. That's what I was doing while they were screaming. I was remitting. And we never turned over, praise God. That, I, I told the captain of that boat afterwards, I said, you are very good. How did you get the boat when we've got daylight down there? How did you get it back down? He says, well, he says, it's just the way you work the rudder. When the wave's up like this, and you, you cut where you can see daylight, you cut back again. you got the bank of the water. I just used the bank of the water to get us back right again. I'm like, well, well, that's true. He was on top. We were on the bottom. So he knew what he was doing up there, and I was very glad he did. But uh, we got back from that, and my interpreter didn't feel like eating dinner. And so we decided to go to our room and rest for one hour. Went to the room and rested for one hour. Well, I was exhausted at the end of that. I have to tell you, I was truly exhausted. And I felt I needed that one hour. I really needed it. I ever heard the expression, you felt like you were all used up? Your batteries were run down. It had been a long day and a hard day. And all I could think is, I'm just going to crash over that bed and sleep for an hour and hope I wake up in an hour. If I don't, I don't care. I'm more tired than hungry. That's the way I felt when I stepped into my room. My interpreter stepped into his room next to me, disappeared in his door. I opened my, key, my door up with my, my little plastic key, stepped in, exhausted, and I met Jesus in that door. Do you know what he said to me? How do you know it was Jesus? I didn't see him. I know his voice. He said, my sheep know my voice, didn't he? And you know what he said to me? I love what he said to me. He said, do you want to dance? That's what he said. Do you want to dance? Now, I am so exhausted. I am like a wet noodle. Why would Jesus say something like that? Oh, that couldn't have been Jesus. Oh, yes, it was. I know his voice. And I looked up with a big smile in the direction I heard the voice, and I said, I sure do. And this song came to me. I gave him my sickness. I gave him my pain. I gave it all down for the joy of the Lord. And I started singing, and my eyes were closed, and I had a little stretch there, and I was dancing with the Lord all alone. And next thing I knew, I looked at my watch. The hour had gone by that quick. I, Whoops, got to get out. I heard the, heard the door open next to me. I knew he had had his rest. I go to the door quickly. I'm still fully dressed. Step out the door. He looks at me and takes a double take. And he says, what are you on? <laughs> it's exactly what he said. What are you on? 
I said, Jesus. He just looked at me. He said, you look like you've been sleeping for ten hours. I said, no, I've been dancing for an hour. A couple times I hit the wall. He heard it. He said, I wonder what you were doing, why you hit the wall. I said, well, I got a little too excited. My hand hit the wall, turning around. It's this narrow area. He looked at me, shaking his head. He says, Henry, you are unbelievable. You really were dancing? I said, yeah. Jesus asked me if I wanted to dance. Well, you know, when there's going to be a marriage, there's a great celebration, isn't there? Wonderful marriages, there's dances. And he's getting us ready to dance with the one that we've fallen in love with. We're his bride. I want to dance with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to enjoy His presence. I want to be well. I want to be strong. I want to be healthy. I want to dance with my Lord. So I had that in January, the end of January. I danced with the Lord and I was rejuvenated and we walked and prayed the next day over that island. I won't take time to tell you the wickedness that took place on that island, but it was totally ridiculous wickedness, unmerciful wickedness that dominated that island. God strengthened me to be able to break down those barriers on Yanaguni Island. By the time we got on the ferry, the, the second day to head back, the seas had calmed down. And, of course, my interpreter was very happy. And uh, we had a nice trip. And it was a bigger ferry going back, which he was also very happy about. But I, I, I enjoyed that time in his presence. Now, you see, if I'm emotional in front of you, then I should be the same alone. If I'm putting on a show, it'll only be in front of you. But if my relationship with the Lord is real and genuine, it'll be alone at probably more than it is in front of you. Isn't that the way it should be? It's the way I look at it. I'm not interested in putting on a show, but I am interested in challenging God's people that there is so much more available from the Lord that we are not partaking of. We are shutting Him down too soon when He's just wanting to get going. And we're grieving Him. And it it hurts Him. And we're going to be married. We're going to be with the Lord forever. It's time to begin to enjoy His presence. Tremendously enjoy His presence. I've got to read this or I'll forget because I'm going to head on on another direction here in a minute. Remember I told you this morning, I'd read you the letter that came from China, from the leader that gave his heart to the Lord. He wrote it, November the 8th, 2009. Now, remember what I said. He said, I'm going to be very busy the next three days. I'll be coming in and out through the Great Hall, the Capitol building. And when I see you, I will nod. And remember, I said to him, and I will nod in acknowledging seeing you, and I will do this. And remember, he said, what does that mean? I said, well, we are brothers. We are one through Jesus Christ, through the Father We have the same father. You're my China brother. I'm your American brother. We are one. And he liked that. Okay, I just briefly said that. All right. So remember the nod in doing this. Here's his letter, his words. Written November the 8th, 2009, in Chinese as well as English. Dear Henry, nice to meet you on the first China International Chongyang Festival in Beijing. You become my very good friend. Even though we have language barrier, we nod to each other every time we see each other as a token of regards. Now that sounded nice, but listen how he follows it up. I think that indicates we have some ties of relationship. 
Now, if you are in a communist country and you are trying to be secretive in a sense of what you're saying, because what you write can be held against you, isn't that beautiful code language? From a brother, a newborn brother in the Lord. I think that indicates we have some ties of relationship. Now I send a picture we've taken together to you for a memorial. I wish our friendship may last forever. Best regards. Gives his name. Then says, P.S. Contact me by email. Gives the email. And then he finishes with, Always feel free to contact me for anything at all. Dot, dot, dot. Concerns, comma, ideas, dot, dot, dot. I value that. I left on the 30th of October to go back. And uh, when I got back home, that letter was waiting for me that had been written the 8th of November. Very precious. The address of that letter comes from the very district where the leaders of China live. I was there. And uh, such a blessing. It's always good to find that the fruit is remaining, isn't it? Now, I have emailed him since and we're in communication, okay? So don't think I've dropped it on that one. I believe that we must continually. And he, his last email, he said, when are you coming back to China? I haven't answered that one yet. I'm still praying. <laughs> All right. Um, the trial of your faith. What is the trial of your faith? You're going to get prayed for tonight. Do you believe when you are prayed for that you are healed? Remember when I battled the cancer? There were two things that I stated. The night that I was anointed with oil by the elders, I was healed because I fulfilled my obedience to the Lord, the criteria for healing. Right? Call for the elders and let them anoint them with oil and the prayer of faith will save the sick, raise them up from the bed of affliction and if they have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven them. All right, so I believe that. That was a very definite one. The next one that I had to zero in on was, because I am healed, how am I going to conduct myself? Am I going to conduct my lifestyle as though I'm still sick or as I'm healed? Now, wait a minute. If the symptoms are still there... <laughs> Am I going to look at the symptoms? Are they going to tell me the truth? No. I must call them lying symptoms. They may be seemingly as real as real can be. They may be as blatant to other people that they see. And they want to say, well, you're not healed. But you say, I was healed. I am healed. But where's the evidence? The Word of God. You see, you keep your faith in action. The other area that I battled in that cancer was this. Because I fully believed I was healed, when the symptoms came, I aimed my prayer guns away from me, and I said, Father, who is battling this cancer? I'm healed. I give myself to pray for them. You see what I mean? You are taking the focus from your physical body away to pray for someone else that's suffering. And believe me, when you're in the midst of suffering, you can pray with such compassion. You can pray effectually in a way that you normally would not. Do you understand that? This is one of the reasons when people ask me, I had a lady just call me last week, and she said, Henry, I, I, they've done surgery, but they want to do chemo. Should I do chemo? And I said, well, why are you asking me? Well, she said, I was hoping you'd say it's 
probably all right. I said, you don't have confidence. No, she said, I don't. I'm looking for it. I said, well, let me tell you what will happen. You take chemo. You wind up in the hospital. If you wind up in the hospital and you become so weak that they begin to give you so much pain medication that you can't think straight, how effective can you be in warfare? You lose your effectiveness. I'm not condemning you if you go to the hospital and take pain medication. If you don't have the faith, go do it. But I want to warn you, if you take that magnitude of pain medication, it will deaden your senses, and when your senses are deadened, your faith will begin to grow weaker and weaker. You will succumb and you will die. I have seen people die that had tremendous faith. But they gave in and went in and took the morphine or the medication. And they were not able to fight anymore. And they died. Remember what I said when I had the cancer. I refused any kind of medication. I believed with all my heart I was healed. And the second thing was, I absolutely made it known to everyone that asked me or saw me, I refuse to give my life for cancer. I will give my life for Jesus, but I refuse to give my life for cancer. You say, well, that is just nothing but pure, blatant stubbornness, Henry. No, it is not. What is your life worth to God? What is your relationship to God worth? If it is of the highest esteem in you, it is held the highest of value to you. What is your life? Jesus said, don't be afraid of those that can kill you. But be afraid of those that can take your spirit, your soul, and your body and cast them into hell, right? That's only God. You see, Satan wants to deaden us down to where we cannot war anymore. We cannot fight. He didn't succeed with me. Now, I had that glorious experience, you know, on the high seas of East China Sea in February. I got home March the 4th. I was at the peak of joy, peak of health. I'd been walking up and down mountains, and I felt great. The ground was still frozen. We still had eight-foot snowdrifts around there where we lived in Woodbine. We had... We had Record-breaking snow last winter. And I had told in January this man next door to the church of my son pastors that I will come and prune that apple tree because the apples won't be any good. It's getting too many suckers. And, of course, the man said, well, I'm not going to pay you. I said, I'm not asking for pay. You let kids from the church go over and pick the good apples and, and enjoy them. And I just want to do it as a thank you. But I'll have to wait till the snow goes down because I can't get a ladder under the tree. So March the 6th, 7th, March the 7th, I could get a ladder under the tree. 16-foot ladder. You know, stretched up there. Got up in the tree. Happily trimming away, pruning away. Had branches laying all over the ground underneath it. Everything's going great. Till I get to the last three branches about this big around up in the top, in the center. (laughs) And I've got the extension ladder as high as I dare get it and still have enough, you know, overlap to be strengthened. The ladder feels strong. So I've got one foot on the top rung and the next one on the next to the top. And I've got my big shears up there. And I'm reaching up and I'm kind of stretching like this to do it. And I get a clamp on that one of those three branches and I start to do this. And next thing I know, I'm going down through the tree. Wham! I hit that frozen ground with my hip right here. Broke my hip. Hit the ground. Sit right up. The big pruning shears come right down. Would have hit me right in the head if I wouldn't have sat right up. Tried to get up. Fell down. Three times I tried to get up and fell down. 
grabbed my hip and thought, well, that's weird. What is going on? Sitting there on the ground, I move my leg. Whoops. There's movement in that bone where there shouldn't be. Oh, no. I broke it. Jesus, I broke my hip. I can't get on the road in a couple of days. Help. Now you hip, you hear the word of the Lord. You go back together in the name of Jesus. I don't have time for a hospital and a cast. Do you hear me? You go back together. Tried to get up, fell down. This is ridiculous. I was determined to get on my feet. Remember, you can't keep a good horse down. I mean, man down. (laughs) I crawled over to that apple tree, grabbed hold of it, and got myself up on my feet. I took my heavy coat off because I did not need a coat then. I was hot. You know sweat? You know pain makes you hot? I kind of tried to take a step away from that apple tree and fell down. Oh, it hurt. I laid both hands on that hip again and I spoke to that hip and said, Now you listen to me. I spoke the word of God to you over there and you better not rebel. You listen to me and you be healed in the name of Jesus. I command you to go back together. Tried to get up, fell down. Moved back over to the apple tree, got myself back. Several times I did this and fell down. Till finally, you know what? I could walk around. It hurts. But I could walk around. So the next thing to do before I try to go up that ladder again is pick up the branches, right? I'm not going to leave that man a bunch of branches all over. So I go to bend over to pick up a branch. Well, you know what happened? I just kept going. I couldn't stop myself. Hit the ground again. Sit up, looked around, when I hope there aren't any neighbors watching. Dear Lord, they'll have the paramedics here in no time. I'm not going to the hospital. I'm going on the road in a couple of days. Laid hands on my hip again, rebuked it, commanded again to hear the word of the Lord, started walking. And you know what? I got those branches put into three piles around that tree. Felt a little, okay, a little better. A little better. Still hurt. But I could walk. I favored it, I have to admit. But I could put a little pressure on it. I could feel it. It was there. It was moving. So then I went to the ladder and looked up, looked at my big shears and thought, I'm not going to use those. I got the little hand, little saw. Thought, I'm not going to get up there where I got to do this. I'm going to get up there where I can hang on with one hand and do this. I'm going to keep hang on with one hand. I got to the top of that ladder and I saw those three branches off. Tossed them off on the side. Felt real good about that. Come back down, got the ladder pushed it over this eight-foot drift, hauled it back to the church, put it back in the utility room, realized I'd left my coat and my shears and my saw laying on the ground, had to crawl back over the eight-foot drift, get my tools, crawl back over that, got into the van, and oh boy, when I tried to climb up in that van and sit down, that hurt. I made it, though. I was sweating. Got home, Walked in the door, kind of like this. <laughs> Judith took one look at me, and she said, Henry Gruber, did you fall out of that apple tree? I says, honey, I just hurt my hip a little bit. I'm going to be all right. She says, you look like you're going to be all right. You are white as a sheet. You are dragging that leg. I says, it'll be all right. Leave me alone. (laughs) I hobbled around. My son John helped me load the van. Next day and the following day, I got on the road. I got to where I was going. We did some walking and praying. It was difficult. Sleeping at night was the hardest part. I didn't get much sleep. Every time you go to move, it's there. I'd lay hands on it again and just say, 
You're healed. You've got to recognize it. Then I begin to realize, wait a minute. Why am I only asking for one hip? Because I was telling my hip, Jesus is going to give me a hip replacement. Man can do it. Lord, you can do better. Without pins and needles and cuts, right? And I remembered how playing baseball with my boys when I was 29, running the base, on that hard-packed ground, I fell, and this hip gave me trouble for a long time. And when the nights get cold, in the night sleeping, it'll wake you up with some pain. They call it kind of like arthritis or something like that. And I realized, wait a minute. I'm not asking for enough. I'm going to ask for two new hips. So then I begin laying hands on both of my hips and thanking Jesus for two new hips. On the road, I did that at night when I would be awakened with the pain. I would lay my hands on, the, on my hips and pray that way, and I'd go back to sleep a little while till I had to move again. And that's the way it went. About two and a half weeks later, on the road, while I was on the road, I woke up one morning at nine o'clock, and I realized I hadn't wakened once in the night. And this big smile come on my face. And I said, Jesus, you gave me my new hips. I got out of bed and I went like that. I couldn't do that before. I had hold of my hip. I just had my undies on. And I went like that and there was no movement. Then I went like that with the other one. I thought, ooh, that feels good too. Lord, you gave me two new hips. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I haven't had any pain since. Not even in the coolness of a night. Mr. Arthur's gone. Hallelujah. So you see, tonight if you've got one bad hip, one bad knee, whatever, one bad eye, ask the Lord to take care of both your eyes because your hip, your knee, your eye, whatever, has been doing all the work. The good one's been doing all the work for you. So it's been getting double time on the wear and tear. So ask the Lord to give you a brand new one on the other one too, all right? Let's not limit the Lord tonight, okay? Let's turn Him loose. He promises to supply every need according to the bankruptcy of heaven. Is that what it says? It doesn't say that? According to the riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Heaven is not bankrupt, people. <laughs> he has new hips. He has new, new legs. He has new backs. He has new heads. You may need a head transplant. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now look, if you're not happy with how you look, don't come up and ask me to ask the Lord to do a makeover on you. Don't, I didn't what I mean about it. I mean headaches and things like that. <laughs> I once read in Reader's Digest that they had uh, interviewed, I forget how many previous uh, Miss Americas. And they just asked each one of them the same four or five questions. First one was, are you totally happy with your looks? Every single one of them had said no. Would you change anything if you could? Every one of them had something they wanted changed. I either had too big a nose, too little of a nose, too big of ears. Something. Mouth not right. Something wrong. Yet they were all Miss Americas. <laughs> See, that isn't the kind of head change I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about headaches, migraines, tumors, anything that your head has been battled with. I have on my cell phone out in the car a brother that called me. I could hardly understand him. I knew him 30 years ago. And he was about to go in for throat cancer surgery. And his voice was so scratchy, I could hardly understand him. But what I fully understood in that phone message was the terror that was upon him. He was ridden heavily with fear. I probably hadn't heard of him in 
heard from him in many, many, many years. But he chose to call me just before he's going into surgery. Now, I didn't, I realized by the time the message came to me, he probably had already had surgery. But what did Jesus say in his word? It shall come to pass that before you call, I will answer. So if he will answer before you call, will he also answer after you call? Absolutely. So please, tonight, don't limit him. Let's, let's see God touch bodies tonight and put the body of Christ back into hell. I don't have one affliction in my body that I know of. Well, I could use a little more hair, but I'm not worried about it. It doesn't afflict me. I just have to wear a hat when it gets cold because it gets colder up there quicker than it does with you, Gordon. <laughs> but that's all right. I don't mind a nice hat. I got all kinds of hats. So that doesn't bother me. That's not an affliction, is it? It's just... Genetics, I guess. I don't know. My daddy was like this, and now here I am too. I don't know. But you see what I'm saying? Don't limit the Lord tonight. Remember the songs we sang? Could you come up? Is there a chance? Could you come up, Sherry? And let's sing, I gave him my sickness. I gave him my pain. I am laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Do we have instrumentalists yet here? Yet have I preached you all out the door? <laughs> Let's just worship the Lord tonight. You don't have to play it and sing it loud, or I'll be hoarse by the time I'm done praying for people. I was at a church up in Vancouver, Washington, praying for people. And my word, they sang and played that instrument so loud, my pant legs were waving. I couldn't talk for a week. And I thought, I think I need healing for my ears. Oh, some churches, they think it's the anointing if it's shaking the walls and the rafters. People, that is not the anointing. That is emotionalism. You know, that is real emotionalism now. And that's what you might call the epitome of emotionalism. And it means we're going to have to have healing lines here in a short period of time for deaf people. <laughs> All right. I think one of, the, one of the biggest businesses coming up in the future is here, our hearing aids for hearing impaired because of the, the way these young people are listening to their music. You sit there at the light and your car is shaking. <laughs> and you look over at them and they're jiving with it. And you think, yeah, I'm afraid to try to say anything to you. You couldn't hear me. Five years from now, you'll say, what's that? I can't hear you. <laughs> Do you hear me now? <laughs> People, take care of your temple. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Take care of your body. But it is not condemnation to have a sickness. It is not condemning of the Lord, condemnatory of the Lord, to have an affliction. It is even scriptural. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord, but the Lord delivers them out of one or two. Them all. Amen. So let's get delivered out of them all tonight. Amen. You need healing? Get up here. Where's the oil? I, I forgot my bottle of oil. Whew, we got one. Oh, thank you. We got a full bottle here. Hallelujah. Let's get healed, people. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, some elders join me here. Come on, brothers. 